So now that we have the normal model, we can finally start introducing this idea of statistical inference. And remember, statistical inference is taking results that <clears throat> came from a sample and generalizing them to a population. To do statistical inference, you have to recognize the fact that random, that statistics such as the sample mean are in fact random variables. Because think about it this way. Let's say I was trying to estimate the uh, mean amount of time students in, at JJC sleep in a, in a night. If I tried to do that study by randomly selecting 30 students, I'm probably going to get a different sample mean than if each of you did it. And the reason that it's going to be different is because we probably have different individuals in our sample. And so because this, and then if I, so each of us are going to get a different sample mean. And so because we get different sample means, depending on who's in the sample, there's variability with that statistic. And that's why it's a random variable because it varies from sample to sample. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because it's a random variable, it's going to have a distribution associated with it. The distribution is called the sampling distribution of the sample mean. What we want to do in this section is come up with a model that describes the shape, the center and the spread of the random variable X bar, okay? Shape, center, spread. So anytime I say describe, that's what you're supposed to think, shape, center, spread, okay? Of the random so, variable? Of the random variable in this case. Okay. And so a sampling distribution of a statistic is a probability distribution for all possible values of the statistic computed from a given sample size N. And in specific, the sampling distribution of the sample mean X bar is a probability distribution of all possible values of the random variable X bar computed from a sample of size N, where the population mean is mu and the population standard deviation is sigma. So if we were to get the sampling distribution of X bar for my JJC scenario, we would literally have to go into, I think there's something like, let's say there's 12,000 JJC students. What I would have to do is take every possible sample of size 30 from those 12,000 students. For each of those samples, compute the sample mean, and then lay out uh, the distribution of all those different sample means. So you can imagine how that's virtually impossible to do, mm -hmm. right? What's tedious. cool, super, yeah, beyond tedious. <laughs> so what we're going to do is something similar to that. I'm going to deviate from the classroom notes because I have this really cool way of, of illustrating this. Let's go into uh, StatCrunch. I just grabbed this data yesterday. Uh, I think I may have talked to you about this data before where it's uh, this website right here called uh, StatCast, mm -hmm. right? I think we talked about this back in chapter seven. Yeah. So this is that same, this is that same data set. So I'm just gonna X this one out so I don't get lost in all this. So this, I was able to get more variables this time that I went through it. So for every single home run hit, I got the velocity that the ball left the bat. This is in miles per hour. So like this home run by Nomar here left his bat at 109.7 miles per hour. The launch angle, the angle from the ground to the, the direction the ball traveled was 27.2 degrees. And the ball traveled a distance of 505 feet. We're going to work. This is for every single home run hit in the 2019 baseball season. Because it's every single home run hit, this is population data, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So let's have a look at what the, the data looks like. I'm gonna draw a picture of the data with a histogram. I'm gonna select distance. And we'll just give this a title, home runs in feet in 2019. And there's the picture of the data. Okay. Now you can see that the graph of the distribution has a pretty nice bell shape to it, except I got this data over here in the left tail that is kind of weird. Now the thing about analyzing any kind of data set is it's very, very helpful to have knowledge about the situation that you're looking at. In this case, what is a home run in Major League Baseball? Well, it turns out a, typical, a traditional home run in Major League Baseball is when the ball travels over the outfield fence. Right. If you think about all the different Major League Baseball parks out there, the outfield fence is always at least 300 feet from where the ball is hit, home plate. And so how can you have home runs that are less than 300 feet? That seems strange. Because it feels strange, we're going to investigate this, these observations. Okay. Now this is, this is actually the first step in any kind of data analysis when you have real data, right? In textbook problems, I, I always end up cleaning up the data before you actually work the problem so that it's always nice. So what's good about seeing this is this is the real process in data analysis is that data is messy and it needs to be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I just left click and draw a rectangle around those observations and I let go. StatCrunch then highlights those observations for me. And you can see I grabbed some that are a little over 300 feet. But what I'm gonna do now is go back to this StatCast website and, and look at these home runs that are short. Like this one that's 298 feet by Ian Desmond. If I click on Ian Desmond in this website, the, the program gives you details on, on the home run. And you'll notice here where it says PA plate appearance result, it's what's called an inside the park home run. Mm -hmm. You can actually watch the video, I think it looks like here. So with an inside the park home run, if you're not familiar with this, the ball never went over the, that outfield fence, but the, the player was able to travel around all four bases. So technically a home run. But this isn't a traditional home run. Compare that to this Stephen Voigt home run of 307 feet. His was hit to uh, on a line drive to right field, but it that wasn't indicated to be an inside the park home run. So in Boston, it's called Fenway Park. They have a very short right field fence. So it's short distance balls can actually travel over the fence still. And so basically what I'm getting at here is for from Ian Desmond on, these are not traditional home runs, so I'm going to eliminate them from my data set. Okay, so these guys here are fine, but these six home runs are inside the park home runs. I'm going to eliminate them from my data set. So I just go data, I'm sorry, edit, rows, delete, hit compute. And now those observations are gone. So now when I redraw my histogram, now it has this really nice bell shape to it. So we would say home runs are approximately normal. The distance a home run is hit is approximately normal. Now I'm going to just compute the mean and the standard deviation of that. So stat, summary stats, columns. And I'm gonna do the mean distance that the ball traveled. And then I'm going to do the unadjusted standard deviation. Unadjusted standard deviation is really the population standard deviation. Hit compute. And these are the results that I get. So we have to monitor this. So just so you know, this 400.3 feet for the mean, that's a population mean. So that's mu. And the 26.0 that's a population standard deviation, that's sigma. 
Deal? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is open this data set up in an applet that we call sampling distributions. So I check this box that says from data table and then it's going to, and then leave statistic at mean. Click, oops, I forgot to click the column distance. So from data table, click the column distance and click compute. So here's the applet. Let me make it a little bit bigger. And there is the histogram. That's this histogram right here. It looks different because it's using different class widths in the applet. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this is the actual distribution of that population data. There's the mean of 400.3. See it? Yeah. And there's the standard deviation of 26.0371. Okay. What I'm going to do is take a random sample of four home runs from this population. So I'm going to click this button that says one time. Watch what happens. Pay attention to the applet. Here we go. Those bars that are popping down are the random samples of size four. So these are my four home runs that I randomly sampled from this population. And then this bar in green at the bottom is the mean home run distance of those four. So this is a sample mean down here in green. Hmm. You follow? Yeah. Okay. So there's the sample mean 394.5 for that one sample. Let me do this a couple more times so you get a feel. Remember what a sampling distribution represents. The sampling distribution for the sample mean is the distribution of all possible random samples, in this case of size four, from this population. To do that would be virtually impossible, but if we do it enough times, we'll get a good sense of what this distribution is gonna look like. I'm gonna take another sample of size one. There's my four home run distances, and then a sample mean. Do it again. There's my four home run distances, and there's a sample mean. So notice, each time I take a random sample of size four, I'm grabbing four different home runs, and therefore getting a different sample mean. And because I'm getting a different sample mean, X bar, the sample mean, is a random variable. Now the other thing that this screen at the bottom is doing is keeping a running tab of the mean of all these means. So this 399.9 that you're seeing right here, that's the mean of those three sample means. So it's a mean of sample means, you follow me? Yeah. And this 5.825, that's a standard deviation of those three sample means. So it's describing the variability in X bar. Okay. So I'm going to do this one more time. Three, I'm sorry, four different home runs, compute the sample mean. Now again, what we want to do is get a sense of what happens if we do this over and over and over again. So to see, to do this over and over and over again, I can click this button a thousand times. You see it? Mm -hmm. So when I click this button a thousand times, it's going to find a thousand different random samples of size four. For each of those random samples of size four, it computes the sample mean and drops it in the screen at the bottom. You follow that? Yeah. There it goes. So now I have a thousand and four samples. You see it? Mm-hmm. The mean of those 1,004 sample means is 400.4. 400 the standard deviation of those 1,004 sample means is 12.8. Let me do this a couple more times. Here's another 1,000 random samples of size four, and another 1,000, and another 1,000, and another 1,000. So now I have 5,004 samples of size four. You see that? Mm -hmm. How would you describe the shape of these 5,004 sample means? 
Pretty bell-shaped. Pretty bell-shaped, right? Yeah, pretty much. What's the mean of those 5,004 sample means? 400.3. Oh, what's the mean of my parent population? <laughs> 400.3. Yep. What's nice. the standard deviation of my 5,004 sample means? 13.2. 13.2. What's the standard deviation of my parent population? 26. 26. And so here's what I think we should be able to conclude from this little scenario. Thing number one, if the parent population is approximately normal, then the distribution of X bar is also going to be approximately normal. The mean of the distribution of X bar looks like it's the same as the mean of the parent population. Right. The standard deviation of the distribution of X bar, but for right now, all we can really say is it's less than the standard deviation of the parent population. Mm -hmm. And that should make sense that the standard deviation of means is going to be less than the standard deviation of individuals because with means, with these four observations, a home run that was hit far can be offset by a home run that's not as far. Right. Conclusions. It appears that if the parent population is approximately normal, and the distribution of the sample mean is also approximately normal. The other thing that it seems is that the mean of the distribution of X bar equals the mean of the parent population. So this is new notation right here that is the mean of the distribution of X bar. And then the standard deviation of the distribution of X bar is less than the standard deviation of the parent population. So that's what we've gotten out of this. So now what I'm gonna do is change my sample size to nine and just redo this. I'm, so like if I hit one time, there's my now I'm grabbing nine individuals from the parent population and computing the sample mean. Follow? Mm -hmm. so I'll just do this a few more times. Again, the what's the shape of the distribution? Bell-shaped. Pretty bell-shaped. We can even zoom this out a little bit. Yep, still pretty bell-shaped. The mean of the parent population and the mean, I'm sorry, the mean of the parent population up here and the mean of the distribution of X bar are pretty much the same. And the standard deviation of X bar is less than the standard deviation of the parent population. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. One other thing that I want you to note though, is this. So conclusions here. For n equals nine, distribution of the sample mean is still approximately normal. We're still going to conclude that the mean of x bar equals the mean of the parent population. We're still going to conclude the standard deviation of x bar is less than the standard deviation of the parent population. There's one other thing that I want you to notice is this. Notice that as the sample size n increases, the standard deviation of x bar decreases, right? The standard deviation of X bar when we had four was 13.2-ish. The standard deviation when we have nine is 8.7-ish. You see that? Yeah. That should also feel reasonable to you because of the fact that 
you're going to have less variability in the sample mean as your sample size goes up. That's a version of the law of large numbers, right? The more times you do something, the less like you, likely you are to veer off from what you would expect. Okay. And so this is what we're going to conclude from that little activity. Suppose a simple random sample of size N is drawn from a population with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. The sampling distribution of X bar has a mean equal to the mean of the parent population. That's what this is saying right here, right? And standard deviation, remember we said the standard deviation goes down as the sample size goes up. So mm -hmm. notice we're dividing, we're dividing by the square root of N as the sample size goes up, the overall value of the fraction goes down, okay? We call the standard deviation of X bar the standard error of the mean. So if you hear me say standard error, that's just short for standard error of the mean. One other thing of note, your sample size has to be small relative to the size of your population in order for this to work. Okay? And so that's the center and the spread of the distribution of X bar. The center is the mean of X bar is the mean of the parent population. The spread is the standard deviation of X bar is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And then for shape, that's right here. The shape of the sampling distribution of X bar is going to be approximately normal if X itself is normal. So if you sample from an, an approximately normal population, the distribution of X bar is also going to be approximately normal. Sound good? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So uh, rather than using that 2019 data, we'll just jump to the 2017 data that we have. Uh, oh, I, I will fix this. Let me make this. The home runs hit in 2019. That also had a mean of 400.3, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah but the standard deviation was 26.0. So a little bit more variability in 2019. Okay, so let's say we're gonna take a random sample of size 16 from this population and we get a sample mean of 405 feet we're gonna compute the probability of getting a sample mean greater than 405 feet, okay? So part A says, hey, describe the sampling distribution for samples of size 16. So here we would say, because the distribution of the parent population is approximately normal, the distribution of the sample mean is also approximately normal. And then the other thing we need is the mean of X bar is going to equal the mean of the parent population, which is 400.3 feet and then the standard deviation of X bar is the standard deviation of the parent population over the square root of the sample size. So that's 26.0 feet divided by the square root of 16. So that's really 26 divided by four, which is 6.5. Now what we're going to do is compute the probability of getting a sample mean greater than 405 feet. Now that we have these parameters right here, that's easy peasy. You just go to your buddy stat crunch and you're going to select stat calculators normal. You said the mean is 400.3 feet. You said the standard deviation is 6.5 feet. 
we want to know the probability X is greater than 405. And I didn't mention this before, I don't believe, but whether you compute the probability of X bigger than 405 versus greater than or equal to 405, it's always going to be the same result. So you don't even have to worry about that. Now we click compute and there's our result. So here we would say the probability X bar is greater than 405 is 0 0.2348. Agreed? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. here's what that means. If we obtained, say, 100 different samples of size n equals 16 from this population, we would expect about 23 of the samples to have a sample mean of 405 feet or greater. So it's the same interpretation that we've always been doing with probabilities. 0.23 is about 23 out of 100. Mm -hmm. So then all you have to do is describe what you've done. In this case, samples of size 16 from the population where the sample mean is go bigger than 405. It's very, very important that you under recognize whether you're doing probabilities about an individual observation X versus a sample mean. Notice here we took a random sample of size 16 and asked you to make a probability statement about the sample mean. Okay, this is different one than what we did in chapter um, seven, where I would say home runs are approximately normal where the mean is 400.3 feet, the standard deviation is 26 feet. And I might say, hey, I randomly selected a home run and it was 405 feet. What's the probability of that happening? Notice how I said that. I randomly selected a home run, one home run. Here right. I'm randomly select, selecting 16 home runs and asking you a question about a different random variable, X bar. So this letter C question down here is not trivial. The notation probability, and I'll just write X bar instead of the symbol, suggests we are conducting a probability statement about a sample mean which requires two or more observations, hopefully from a random sample. The notation probability X bigger than 405 is a probability statement about one observation. Okay, so you have to be super careful about the notation, super careful about the way the questions are phrased. Sound good? Yes. Yeah. And by the way, this is an idealized situation. This is, this statement in letter B is what I would expect to happen if I did this over and over and over again. I, let me see if I can do this in StatCrunch to give you a sense of this. So we did a sample of size 16, correct? Uh-huh. Yeah. Let's say we did this over and over and over again, like 10,000 times. I'm wondering if I can export this data. It doesn't look like I can. Oh, wait. Yeah, I can. Analyze. So these are all my sample means from those 10,000 times I did it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Graph, histogram of all those sample means. Remember how I used this divider thing before? Yeah. When I click, let me title this, 10,000 sample means 
from this population where n is 16. So that normal curve, if this thing's working out the right way, if I type in 405 in here, look what I'm getting, 0.242. What did we get when we used the normal model? Uh, 0.235, basically. You see how they're pretty darn close to each other? Uh -huh. So this on the left is an idealized description of what would happen. Here's what happened if I actually do this over and over again. You see how they're close? Yeah. So the normal model does a darn good job of explaining what would happen if I did do this over and over and over again. So that's why this thing works. As long as your model requirements are satisfied. Like this would not work if your, sam if your parent population didn't have that normal curve to it. So that's the other thing about statistics that's really important. The only reason this graph here is working is because our conditions for doing it were satisfied. 